Is it time for protein bar brands to party like it's 2019 again? So I'll decode that introductory question very shortly, but I wanted to provide some background on the inspiration for this content. Last week, a research analyst at one of the largest investment banks in the world asked me a few questions about shifting convenient nutrition marketplace dynamics, including some directed towards delivery formats. And it was the bar delivery format that seemed to draw the most curiosity within our conversation. Maybe it's because of what happened to the protein bar category because of the great lockdown. Maybe it's because out of bars, liquids, and powders, it has the lowest current retail sales growth rate, but the highest household penetration. Or maybe it's because of the sharp contrast from five short years ago when the protein bar M&A market was arguably at its peak. And I know any event before 2020 seems like a generation ago, so maybe you forget that the Hershey company acquired one brand, the maker of one bar, in August of 2019 for $397 million. To get yourself back in that late summer of 2019 protein bar party mindset even deeper, just a week earlier than the Hershey and One Brands news, it was also announced that the Simply Good Foods company acquired Quest Nutrition for $1 billion. So in that extremely short stretch of time, two of the most buzzworthy convenient nutrition bar brands positioned inside of the high protein, low sugar world were acquired. But also don't forget, and I know it's positioned a little bit differently in the market and the product is a bit different, but Mondelez International purchased a majority stake in Perfect Bar that same year in June. The truth is that being a protein bar company in the summer of 2019 was arguably one of the most valuable things you could be in the growing functional food space. That is, until it wasn't. Because the bar format of convenient nutrition is strongly tied to consumer mobility. The great shutdown in March and April of 2020 caused a sharp decline in consumption. Moreover, continued restrictive living situations and work from home adjustments along with the fact that health and fitness and maybe weight management overall fell to the wayside for a lot of Americans during that initial period. And suddenly the value propositions of protein bars were no longer the star of the convenient nutrition market and dollar sales declined around 6% year over year in 2020. But during this external threat heightened period, most of the savviest large convenient nutrition portfolio companies that sold a lot of protein bars like Simply Good Foods Company, which owned, again, as I mentioned, Quest Nutrition, and then they also own Atkins Nutritionals, used a two-part survival strategy. The first and easiest strategic shift was protein bar brands adjusting the marketing communications to essentially reframe the use education, showing consumers that at home was the new on the go. The other strategic shift was tougher to pull off, especially for those convenient nutrition brands that didn't already have product innovations in market, but it prioritized high protein versions of more relatable snacking formats like cookies, chips, and confectionery that increased usage occasions, created incremental consumption, and provided new customer acquisition opportunities. But during that time, many of us industry analysts and strategists looked past the near-term categorical struggles and pointed to the fact that underlying drivers feeding long-term secular trends were unchanged and the inevitable consumer behavior normalization would continue to support bar format growth. Admittedly, some of that bounce back was slower than consensus expectations, partly caused by price inflation driven volume loss. In addition to that, the before mentioned product format diversification survival strategy of these companies was probably too effective. In a relatively new functional foods world, many of these like apples to apples formats to bars like protein brownies or cookies caused some cannibalization as it presented consumers with more choice at home to snack responsibly. And then finally, some of the poor performance could be linked to large convenient nutrition portfolio companies that sold protein bars like Bellring Brands, but deprioritized that format for others like liquids and powders that grew strongly over the last four year period. 
Similarly, large CPG brand portfolios like Hershey's and Kellogg's deprioritized the major protein bar brands they owned because other segments of their businesses were printing money from the huge spikes in demand. And it was kind of all hands on deck to keep the supply flowing into the market. But for this last part of the content, I wanted to review several signals I've been watching over the past probably 15 or so months that could tell me that protein bars could be getting ready to party like it's 2019 again. And I guess I'll start by first addressing or I guess rebutting against some of those marketplace comments I just made. First, most of the standard store grocery merchandising that comprises much of the revenue at large CPG brand portfolios is now seeing flat or slightly negative volume and sales numbers. That's much different compared to the protein bar category that's trending towards 7% growth right now after posting a 4% growth in 2023. As for my earlier point on the convenient nutrition format to format competition, I'd be thinking about this in two different buckets. Firstly, yes, powders and liquids have grown a lot in large retail channels over the last four years compared to bars, but I think they're both incremental to the larger health and wellness CPG consumption trends. On the other end, the protein snacks cannibalization threat to bars will be minimized as the return to office momentum heats up, thus increasing consumer mobility even more in 2024. This distinction between work and home will help consumers separate the product formats in their mind and grow usage occasions and incremental consumption overall within convenient nutrition, like it was intended. Finally, to close my thoughts around this first signal I'm watching, in terms of price inflation, most protein bar companies haven't signaled further price increases in 2024. That being said, the biggest worry would be if the milk proteins commodity markets continue to be volatile and prices of that major product input goes back up. And maybe this is a good transition into the second signal I'm watching within the protein bars market, and that would be product-based differentiation. Now, longtime followers of my content likely know my feelings on how product-based differentiation is simply a transient advantage within these low barriers to entry functional CPG markets, but hear me out here. Imagine your protein bar is at this cocktail party and it's talking to a potential customer it doesn't know yet, but wants to make a good first impression. What does it lead with to make them more interested? If it's XYZ, functional ingredient or ingredients that's super novel and requires tons of education to understand and being justification for its poor taste, then you've already bored them to death and lost that opportunity. Food and flavor science has evolved a great deal in the last handful of years. So protein bar products that have added functional ingredients should taste and feel like functional candy bars at this point with great taste now mandatory for categorical customers, regardless of adding nutraceutical ingredient this or that, savvy brand owners will then use those functional ingredients in a slightly different way to support their bold strategic narrative. If you lead the conversation with focusing on those functional ingredients, that product feature is too easy to copy and provides you an insufficient defensible moat. Instead, those ingredients should move to the background over time and become foundational support of the health and wellness need state targeted, such as focus and cognition, gut health, energy, or relaxation. That will guide your entire internal and external business activity. If you want a good example of this, look at the recent adjustments to product or branding or marketing and just kind of overall business strategy at IQ Bar. They are a key contributor to the protein bars containing functional mushrooms market that saw something like a 500% year over year growth in 2023. And maybe this is a good time to jump into the third signal I'm watching, which is an adjacency to a key one-two punch of underlying drivers within the entire convenient nutrition space. Before I mention that adjacency, the two very important underlying drivers supporting this long-term secular trend is the overall health and wellness spending shift that's over-indexed on younger consumers and then snacking convenience. I recently read that half of consumers say they often eat snacks instead of a meal because they're on the go, with 68% of 25 to 34-year-old consumers having three or more snacks per day. What's so appealing about these functional foods 
is they promise a time efficient form of nutritional insurance that's less expensive than fresh groceries that seem to yield higher waste within busy schedules. Consumers, health priorities and goals are weighted against financial constraints and general fatigue. So the value and convenience of snacks and bars over meals resonate with a wide audience. Now, I'm not saying that that swap is great for overall nutritional trends, but consider the convenient alternatives that plague our society today. Which brings us to the rise in GLP-1 weight loss solutions. These weight conscious consumers are looking to incorporate products in their routine that will satisfy their hunger, but at the same time also be relatable, indulgent-like taste profiles that can support their evolving health and wellness goals. In my opinion, you're going to see protein snacking brands, especially those focused on weight management or kind of weight wellness consumers, get repositioned on the right side of GLP-1 second order effects through both product innovation and marketing communications. Like what happened in 2020 or 2021, most of the innovation will come in the targeted communication strategy arena, but we will continue to see product innovation from competitors in areas like heftier protein content to maintain muscle mass, extra fiber to support gut health, and avoidance of added sugars for blood sugar management. And then the final two signals I'm watching within the protein bar space are more focused on the attractiveness of the space and format to build within, and then deal making or liquidity event probabilities or possibilities. Let's talk about the attractiveness of the space and format to build within first, because an interesting data point has been flashing in my face. I think it's very telling when a previous protein bar founder that got a massive liquidity event decides to come back into the space, presumably after his non-compete period was over. What I'm referring to is Peter Rahal, who co-founded RX Bar and sold the brand to Kellogg's for $600 million in October of 2017. Well, he is back in the protein bar business as of March 2024 with a high protein, low calorie, blood sugar friendly brand called David. And then lastly, for protein bar brands to party like it's 2019 again, we need a deal-making environment that provides excitement for these entrepreneurs. In the last five years, many of the upstart protein bar brands have matured in the marketplace. A name like the before-mentioned IQ Bar comes to mind again, but also another plant protein name like No Cow or Aloha that just got a significant $68 million minority investment from private equity. On the other side of the protein input choices, Built Bars, Bear Bells, and Anabar have performed extremely strong. Plus, I'm hearing that Pervine Foods, maker of celebrity chef Robert Irvine's Fit Crunch Bar brand, are up for sale, being marketed off of $50 million in EBITDA over the last year. Also, you had in December of last year, Bain Capital acquiring a significant stake in 1440 Foods that owns the large protein bar brands, Pure Protein and Metrics but I just want to end with some quick final thoughts. In the next five to seven years, I believe the nutritional snacking category can double as retailers build additional space and place additional focus on it. Whether it's bars or liquids, powders, or other snacking formats, these convenient nutrition subcategories collectively continue to benefit from wellness-minded snacking and convenience underlying drivers. And it's an exciting functional CPG space to be positioned within as this secular trend builds even further momentum. So maybe it's time to get those party supplies out of the closet and dust them off. But I hope you enjoyed this YouTube video. If you did, consider hitting that like button to support me. Also help me get to my new short-term goal of 4,000 subscribers by hitting that subscribe button. I'd love to see you join me on this journey, but we need to fix the fact that slightly more than 90% of you that are watching this YouTube video right now are not subscribed to my channel, and that makes me extremely sad. But I do wanna thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you on the next one.